right, all right. So that was good. I like starting it out like that. That was a good, that was a good start. So I, but as you're making your way back to your seat, I want to tell you a couple of things. One thing that, that uh, I thought was just an incredible deal, and I, I wanted to be sure that I took the time to recognize but Wednesday night in here, man, Nate is whew, knocking it out the park. So Wednesday night, he and some other guys have been working to get ready uh, to get ready for the the big show that's coming. And they did a rise night Wednesday night, and they had 250, 260 kids in here Wednesday night, and they were getting after it. So. Man, I celebrate that because it not, just, not just that they can amass a bunch of kids, but man, these kids are getting Jesus because Pastor Matt came in here that night and dropped the word on them, and you guys know how that went. It went good. He, he just so, so Matt and Nate, you guys, y'all knocked it out of the park, and I'm just thankful that Nate and Camille's marriage is getting better. Camille came back to church with him today. <laughs> Camille's like, why do you always do that? <laughs> Their marriage has been great. She's been working out of town. So, I mean, as great as it can be with Nate. I don't know <laughs> how that works. But. And speaking of amazing marriages, I got one of those. And Mama Fine's birthday's tomorrow. Yeah. So make sure you hug her neck. She'll be 24 tomorrow. And so you hug her neck and let her know how awesome she is. She's amazing. So... I mean, really, the whole point of everything that we do, we want to start doing a much better job of communicating, not just communicating the vision, but communicating the vision and the why of the vision. Because here's the deal. If you're not going to come in here and experience God, we, we should just move on. We don't want to just amass I don't want to just Wednesday night. Man, Nate, I loved Wednesday night. I don't want a bunch of kids to come together and hang out, though. I want them to come meet Jesus, man. So when we come together, whether it's a Wednesday night youth, this morning, Wednesday night kids, what Pastor Tori's doing with those kids, man, I'm just telling you as an adult, hey, nope, I'm just saying, you find your way back there and, and say, walk into that room and say, hey, can you get some of these kids to pray over me? You better get ready to be blessed because they are going to pray over you, and it's an amazing thing. And so I was thinking about the Matt and Nate and Pastor Tori. Man, Stephanie, we got, if you don't know, Stephanie works with us now. And, man, what an asset she's already become to us. And, and we just have had these incredible people. So all of you that have anything to do, I just want to say you're the best. Thank you. We got an amazing team, and it's an awesome thing to see what's going on. And I think I was thinking about that because it was kind of an aha moment for me. It's like I look around, and I was like, oh, it, was that, it was that aha thing, and the light bulb came on. And do you guys know there's stuff happening in the room that you don't even know about? And there's, there's just this life being this life-giving transaction that's going on all around the room. And what that is, why that's important, what that's about, whether you're a member and you're a part of it, or if you're visiting and you're not, listen, I would say to you, jump in because the water is good. And there is this thing, and that's what experiencing God is all about. Experiencing God. You come in and, and you have this experience with God. And then, as you get caught up, in that experience with God, what you find out is, is that, man, I didn't even know I had this in common with this person and this person. Every time we come back from a men's deal, our men are like, man, I, I didn't even know I liked that guy. And I really like him. And, or, or whatever it is, you know, on our, you know, Michael's bringing the men together and just and, and, and doing this thing. And it's just a powerful, men come together, women are coming together. So we're experiencing God. We're finding friends. And I'm just telling you, as you engage and you experience God and you find these friends, what happens is your life, the, the, the things that give you life starts to change. 
And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm finding life in new ways and, and new things are bringing me life that I didn't think could bring me life. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm driving down the street and I got life coming out of me that I didn't recognize. That's why the river. Experience God, find friends, and discover life. We are not interested in just being a group of people that you can come sit with once a week. We want those three things to happen to you on every level, every time we come together. Every single in time. And so, my, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about the staff, and I was thinking about what's going on, and, and the message last week, and the message the week before, and, and, and Matt, Matt's in Amarillo at a church today dropping the word on him. That's all part of, that's all part of what God's doing here and among us. We're supposed to be getting together and getting this thing and then carrying it out. That's what it looks like. And I was thinking about the staff and thinking about you. And I walk around this room all the time when it's empty. And I walk around the chairs and I know who you are and where you sit. And, and it was like this aha moment for, oh my gosh. Not only am I waiting to see what God's about to do, but he's in the middle of doing this thing. And I had this aha moment this week and I was thinking about it and and so I was like man that goes in perfect with my message and not just the aha moment and you know you know you've had one of these where you've been on the phone with somebody and you're tearing your desk up and they're they hear you they hear you're distracted and they're like what are you doing and you go I'm looking for my phone and as soon as it comes out of your mouth you're like oh my gosh I know I did not just say to the person I'm on the phone with that I'm looking for my phone that's an aha moment. That's not what I'm talking about. I want to I take you to a place today. I want to take you to a place today that will be a profound aha moment. How, how profound? Well, almost as profound as watching Jeffrey walk in the back door earlier. My man home from school. No, no, no. I'm talking about a profound aha moment. A moment that's beyond describing i found a video that describes an aha moment like i'm about to try to take you to in your faith and i want you to see this because i think it puts you in the right mindset this kind of aha moment make sure you guys turn it up so we can hear the sound don't break it And it came with balloons and all that. Oh my goodness. I can put these on and yeah, it'll see color like it was supposed to be. It'll like correct, how we all see it. It'll yeah. correct your eyes so that you'll see how it's supposed to see it. That's a good one. I'm a color oh, good. Good. Of course, that's a good choice, my man. Oh, yeah, that has to be the volume right here. Mm -hmm. You're very top right. <laughs> See how the sun goes down in there like that? Yeah, you don't see it. Oh, my God. You can 
see that one it's just, it's just, It was fuzz and haze. It wasn't like oh, a it distinct it race. Know what it was. No. I mean, can you imagine? I'm talking about an aha moment. I believe so firmly in this series that the Lord's put on my heart about your Thanksgiving that I truly believe it's going to be a moment for your faith to, to like see color where you haven't seen color before. I'm talking about those videos where you, you see those people put, you know, go through and have that procedure or those cochlear implants or whatever and they first turn it on and, and you see their face when they hear sounds for the first time when they've never heard sound. I'm telling you, I believe that big that this series is going to be an aha moment for your faith, that you're going to be able to open up a, a new level of understanding. And it's going to be like in your faith when you see color where you've never seen it or to hear sound where you've never heard it. And why? Because of this. We talk in this church all the time about purpose and about destiny. And I think as we talk about, you know, issues like that, those are, oh, those are pretty cool sounding churchy words and, and, and they can really easily become kind of a cliche thing until you encounter destiny, until you start to encounter purpose. And all of a sudden something inside you changes and, and you, start, you start discovering I, I've done this church thing for my whole life and all of a sudden I'm, I'm starting to figure something out and purpose and destiny stop becoming just some churchy sounding words but they start becoming a reality that you're living yes. you start walking in purpose and and all of a sudden why you do something that you do starts to have meaning you start to ask why you do the, the things that you do because you don't want to do stuff anymore that doesn't have meaning because purpose has grabbed you and destiny starts to become a real thing for you to walk in i'm telling you that's what god's plan is for us to start walking in purpose and destiny and so we ask how how do we do that here's the answer and i'm, I'm telling you we're going to dive deep into this but here is the answer how do we know if we're on the right track of encountering purpose and destiny? It's this. What does your thanksgiving look like? You start really pulling this thing apart and you start really digging in and asking what does your thanksgiving look like listen i'm not talking about your thursday this week i'll tell you what my thursday is going to look like gonna have some turkey in it it'll be awesome gonna have some ham gonna have some giblet gravy it'll be good gonna watch some cowboys smash them redskins it's gonna be awesome because we're going to the super bowl this year and i don't want to hear anything else out of anybody It's going to be a good day. That's not the Thanksgiving I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a, a checklist of, like, again, like, push play on the prayer. Yeah, God, I'm thankful for this, this, this. Let me, I'm, I'm going to ask you something. As I was going through this and pressing into this, God's drastically changed some things in my life. Drastically. Giving me the ability to ask, why am I thankful for some of the things that I'm thankful for? When was the last time you held hands with someone and looked at that hand and thought, man, I'm so, I'm so thankful for this hand. I put on some socks this week, and, and as I was putting them on, this whole thing, it sunk, it's sinking in so deep, and I thought, man, God, thank you for socks. And I meant it. I was so thankful. And then, I, and then I was like, I walk into my closet and I'm like, God, I got the girliest guy's closet in the world. Thank you for shoes. I got a lot of them. And they're cool. And I was thankful for them. Just starting to think about the things that you're thankful for. Yes, that's part of it. But beyond that, we're going to go beyond that. And today... We're going to look and talk about where your thanksgiving comes from and what your thanksgiving looks like. So here's what I start with. Here's two different groups. Now, the good thing is 
If you're married, your spouse is going to know the truth. You can lie to yourself, but trust me, he or she will tell you the truth. But other than that person, probably nobody else in the room is going to know this answer. And so I want you to think about which group you really fit in. Don't verbalize it, please, because we'll all be embarrassed. But just think about this. We're determining the condition of our heart, what our thankfulness looks like, and here is two groups of people. This is, this is the only option. Two groups of people. You find yourself in one of these. The thankful. The thankful lives life like this. I, I owe. I owe. I owe something. I can't get over the concept that the maker of life Jesus, the word says that nothing that's ever been made would have been made without my Jesus. The maker, listen, the author of life who breathed life into you and I, who breathed life into animals, who created the mountains and the oceans. The Bible says that he told the oceans where they'll stop. That guy, that he would leave, he would leave heaven and come let me spit in his face. How do I get over that? I owe him. I owe him my marriage, and I owe him the ability or the, the desire in me to give him the best possible marriage I ever could. I owe him my life. I owe him my home, and I owe him everything. He's, I owe him. Does that describe you? A thankful person is a person that thinks he or she owes. A thankful person is content. A thankful, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm that guy. I'm trying to be that guy, okay? And I think we, a lot of us are in that boat. But a thankful person is content. They're grateful. They're indebted. They're overwhelmed. They're pleased. They're relieved. They're satisfied. Are you a thankful person? Does your relationship with Jesus, is it described by that group? Or is it described by this group? The unthankful person is a person that believes he or she is owed something. Well, that didn't work out like I thought it was going to. God, what's up with that? Where were you on that one, God? How does this, how did I get to this spot? God, do you even care? It's me. I, I wonder if you ever feel like you're owed. An unthankful person is critical. They're thankless. They're unappreciative. They're ungrateful. They're careless. They're rude. They're cruel. And I wonder if we were to be honest and describe not just what we think we want to be, but we describe the 24-7 grind of the real life. I wonder which category we find ourselves living in most often. Stay with me because here's the, here's the point of this. If you, if you will ask yourself these things and if you, will go, if you will give yourself permission to go into your heart and say, heart, what are you thankful for? What does the giving of thanks in my life really look like we have to we have to understand what flows out of our heart so that we can figure out the condition of our heart and here's the reason I want you to get this what you're thankful for determines the altar where you worship it's huge I'm going to say that again I want you to get this what you're thankful for. Not what you say once a week. What you're thankful for. You can't stop your heart from feeling thankful for something. What you're thankful for will determine and reveal to you the altar where you worship. Every single time. That's why we hate so much. And don't worry, I'm not. But that's why we hate so much in the church talking about finances. Because we don't want to talk about what 
they're connected to. This is not a financial issue. This is a heart issue. That's why Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks so that we can evaluate what's coming out, so that we can evaluate what's going on. That's why he said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. What does that mean? What you're thankful for is the altar that you worship at. It's a big deal, church. It is an absolute huge deal. Why? Because Proverbs 4.23 says this. The New King James Version reads this way. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You don't get to have any say-so in it. Doesn't matter. Deepest of atheists, Jesus chasing freak of freaks of Jesus people. And everything in between. The issues of life come from your heart. They flow out of your heart. I like the way the New Living Translation version reads. It says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Your heart's a big deal. Let Let me say what that means. Guard your heart. I, I, I don't know if this is the right way to do it or not, but I'm going to probably make him mad, and I'm not, I'm not going to let him punch me, but, but Paul Jones in the back of the room understands guard your heart. There's a reason he's back there. There's a reason he's back there. He's back there for you, and you don't even know anything about it. Yeah. Something bad tries to happen. There's a plan in place in this place. So, just a side note, for all you Lone Rangers, because there's probably about 200 guns in this room today. If something shakes down, just lay down and let them handle it, okay? Because y'all going to start shooting, and we're all going to die. Be ugly. There's, there's guard in place. By the way, he's fixing to do a CHL class in our church, just a little side note, a little... And so if you want to do your CHL, if you want to take your concealed carry class, you need to see Paul Jones before you leave today. He's getting ready to do one of those here. And and that's who you want to go through it with. But there's a plan in place. Guard. Something bad happens. Something bad happens. There's a plan in place to guard things. There's a plan in place. It's a crazy. Those guys, they're, they're good at what they do. I didn't even know. They were describing to me the plan in place. It doesn't matter who it's here. If it's me preaching, somebody else preaching, one of those guys that's incognito, he's there ready to, because somebody wants to come in and hurt somebody, there's a plan in place. There's a plan in place to take care of business. Because if you're going to guard something, you've got to do it on purpose. I'm preaching. You don't even know I'm preaching. There's a plan in place because if you want to guard something, it's not going to happen accidentally. Guard your heart above all else. What does that look like? Well, listen, if you've never hugged Michael Decker, you should hug him. This, I mean, I, don't, I mean, he's, he's kind of old. <laughs> Even for me. But he, if you hug him, he don't feel very old. If he decides that it's time to get up and hurt Cinda, he's going to meet a flying monkey off of this stage. (laughs) I'm fighting him. Why? Because that's life. I guard her with, I bleed out in a second for her. The Bible says, guard your heart above all else. I'm telling you, it's not going to happen without planning it. Do you have a plan to guard your heart like that? Because if you learn what it means to guard your heart above all else, you're not going to accidentally find yourself scrolling through some of the filth you find yourself scrolling through. You do that because there's no guard in place. You do that because there's nothing, of, of, there's no threat in place over your heart. You can engage in whatever actions without anything bothering because there's no guard in place. Above all else, guard your heart 
because out of it flow the issues of life. It's not a big deal what I watch. Not a big deal what I, I'm not trying to go old crazy preacher on you. I'm just saying, of course it's a big deal because whatever comes in through these is connected to this and then this is connected to this and what I talk out of this, I walk on tomorrow. The eyes are the window to the soul and what I fill my soul with conditions my heart and the condition of my heart is shown by the overflow of my mouth and my life circumstances become what comes out of my mouth. The windows to your soul are supposed to have guards in place to protect you. The word says guard it above all else. Why does it say that? Because in Matthew chapter 12, you'll see. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 33. Either make the dead gum tree, and you got to be careful adding words because this is Jesus talking, but I'm pretty sure he would have said dead gum. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the thing bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. <clears throat> Brood of vipers. Y'all think I talk bad about religious people. That's who he's talking to, religious people. Religious people. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure in his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, you better hear this. For every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. We think that it's not a big deal. We think that what comes out isn't a big deal. We think that we just get caught up in saying these things, and we think it's not a big deal. Church, I'm telling you, it's a big deal deal this is why even for believers because i've tried to preach this and teach this and i don't i don't know if you're catching what i'm passing but i'm just telling you one day even believers you're going to stand in front of judgment you're going to give an account for your life and one of the things you're going to going to give an account for is the words that you say you can't keep doing oh i know but i say oh i know but i talk doesn't work like that church when my words don't line up with what I say I believe, hey, listen to me. When my words don't line up with what I say I believe, it's because I don't really believe what I say I believe. I don't believe it. Or my words will begin to line up with it. Because there is this, there is this, this thing in our mouth that we can't seem to control and you don't understand but I'm trying to tell you something there's no on off valve for your tongue your tongue has power in it you don't get to say oh no it doesn't the tongue has the power of life and death you keep speaking something guess what you're going to end up walking truth can't shut it off can't shut it off. I can't get well, can't get, can't get better, can't get blessed, can't get, can't get, can't get. Stop wondering why you don't have. Can't get, can't get, can't get. Don't have, don't have, don't have. It connects, church. It just, it just connects. Our words have the power of life and death, and we don't get to choose. And by the way, just to say I'm joking at the end of it doesn't change what you said. You can't say filthy, horrible, mean, jerky things to your spouse and then go, I was just teasing, and think it gets erased. It doesn't get erased. It just means you were a jerk and you don't want to admit it. Woo. So, so the, well, the heart is a well where you draw your words from and, and you just don't get to, to have any say-so in that. It's just a reality. Your words, let everyone around you know what the condition of your heart is. I wish that it wasn't the case, but it, it is the case. James chapter 3. Look at verse 1. My brethren, 
let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. If, if I could erase a part, I'd erase that part. Because I love teaching. But I hate, I hate, I'm, I'm, I have a level of fear in the thought of what's going to happen when I stand in front of my king. Because guess what? He's going to judge my actions. He's going to judge my words. And I don't get to go, I was just teasing. It's not going to work. I'm going to give an account for it. And it's a big deal. And I, I'm thankful for it and I'm scared of it all at the same time. I'll just be honest with you. But look at verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths and, and, they, uh, and make them obey us, and, they tur- and it turns their whole body. Look at a ship. Although they're so large, they're driven by a fierce wind. They are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and it boasts great things. See how great a forest fire, a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire, church. There's no off valve. It doesn't matter. You're not exempt. The tongue in your mouth is a fire. A world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among its members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it itself is set on fire by hell. Every kind of beast and and bird, reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but not the tongue. It says uh, how big of a fire started... If you, you guys read, you know what's happening in California right now as we speak. This fire has burned 150 acres. 76 people today are dead because of this fire. 1,300 people are still lost, have not been accounted for because of this fire. And it started with a spark. And it's consumed life. I wish you would hear what I'm saying. It starts with a spark and it consumes life. Because you preach a message like this and I always encounter people that go, ah, you're doing too much, too much. Your words, they're not that big a deal. Your words are that big a deal. You wonder why your life is burning up. You wonder why everything around you is on fire. You wonder why you can't maintain anything. You wonder why you have no control. You wonder why things don't get better. Start listening to your mouth because that thing in your mouth has got your whole life set on fire. And if you would tame it, everything else in life would follow it. Everything in life would follow it. That verse, I, why, why can I be so confident? Because listen to me, church. That verse says it defiles the whole body. Why? Because that tongue in your mouth is connected directly to the driver's seat of your life. Well, I know I shouldn't say. No, if you know you shouldn't say it, then stop saying it. Stop. Because you're setting the course of your life. I, people always, they always critique. They say, you can't just say your words or where you walk tomorrow. Absolutely. What you speak today is where you're going to walk tomorrow. A hundred percent. That's what the word just said. That's what the word says in James. That's what it says in Proverbs. The things of life come from it. So I want us to understand, I'm trying to dig so hard so that we can see one thing. It's about the condition of your heart. It's about the condition of your heart. Finish reading what that says. Look at verse 8. No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless God the Father, and with it, we curse men. Whew. Yeah, but what? I, I mean, I'm only cursing him because... He's wrong, and he said something really wrong about me. I'm right in what I said. He's wrong. If you'll hear me make this one statement, it'll change a lot of your life. 
you want to develop a life that looks like Jesus, you have to start living like Jesus. And Jesus, when forced with the issue of being love and being right, he surrendered the ability to be right every time. He surrendered his ability to be right in order to be love. He never compromised. I would be right in doing this, but I wouldn't be love. No, no, you don't understand what they said to me. Hey, truth, it's time to grow up in your faith a little bit. Not only do I not understand what they said about you and what they said about me, I don't care what they said. You still got to figure out how to love them. That's the point of maturing in our faith that we start changing things. We got to start changing some of those things and it says so we we bless God and we curse men verse 10 out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings my brethren these things ought not to be does a spring put forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water what's that mean that means you got to quit talking out of both sides of your neck you can't do it. You can't be life, live life, want God, experience the things of God, and keep talking about death and, and not have any control. Yeah, but the verse we just read, I know, I know what you're thinking because I think it too. Yeah, but we just read, no man can tame it. So you know what we do? We say, oh yeah, well, the verse says no man can tame it. So we want to wad the whole chapter up and throw it in the trash. Except for the problem is verse 2. Back up to verse 2. For we all stumble in many, in many things. But if anyone does not stumble in the word, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. And so instead of throwing it in the trash, what we're supposed to do is strive for verse 2. Strive for it. We're supposed to strive for it. Why would we strive for it? Because like I said a while ago, the king of kings died for us. So the reason we don't want to strive is because we haven't ever figured out how real it is that our king died for us. So the condition of our heart doesn't warrant thankfulness to come out. Because we don't ever stop and evaluate where we would be without him. So we just give our mouth permission to let it be and say and do whatever it wants to say. Speak filth, challenge, run it, run it constantly, talking bad about, yeah, but they, does that, no, 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 no. There's no on-off switch, church. There's absolutely no on-off switch. And so we strive, we strive to tame the tongue because that's our standard. We're talking about our words because our words describe for us the condition of our heart. And church, listen to me. Hear me say this. The condition of our heart matters. We have to look at the condition of our heart because that's where we'll find out what our thanksgiving looks like. And honestly, please hear everything that I'm saying because if you just hear part of it, you'll, it'll, it'll give you the, some of you the ability to be mad at me, but hear the whole thing honestly because we don't evaluate we don't evaluate the condition of our heart that's the main reason that worship does not translate to so many people worship doesn't mean anything to so many people you come in you can sit you hear songs you hear them people sing people get up emily get up and talk about pieces shut your mouth man that takes me to jesus And, it, and you miss it because you don't evaluate the condition of your heart. Why do you not evaluate the condition of your heart? Because it's hard. That's why worship doesn't have any meaning. I'm not slamming you. And hear me, listen to me. This is where I want you to hear the whole thing. It is not, worship is not an introvert, extrovert thing. Introverts like me, ah, Jesus! Extroverts like you can be, Ah, Jesus on the inside and nothing show on the outside. It's not an introvert, extrovert thing. The introverts and extroverts, their worship will look drastically different, but it doesn't make one right and one wrong. But those people that sit in and are like, oh no, this song takes too long. You got to play that thing again. We all know you can play the guitar, you can just show it off. Just saying. Hey, I'm telling you. 
what I'm saying to you is, I love you, but that's because your heart sounds like this. You have a hard heart. So why do I need to know that, Mark? Because I'm telling you that the condition of your heart matters. This is where we draw the sense of life from. This is where everything, this is what our thankfulness comes from. We draw our sense of life, we, what we're thankful to from this place. And thankfulness is the result. Hear me, hear me, because it's aha. One, in a minute, this is going to click. Thankfulness is the result of of what you fill your life up with because we love us truth of the matter we love us some us for real why we got shoes all kinds why we got we like pampered drive by our house and if there's enough gas in the tank the car's going to be running for a while because we want it warm when we get in because we love us we want things, we want to condition the environment around us. And some of y'all are like, yeah, and right now I'm ready to go home. <laughs> and you're, in, you're invading the condition of my space. I'm ready to be done with church. Okay, I'm just saying. It's a heart issue, and you draw your sense of life from what you attach your thankfulness to. Thankfulness is the result of what we fill ourselves up with. And you can't change it. Man, I cannot believe I left. I got a whole bag full of leaves in my, in my office. And I meant to bring them. And I forgot them. That's okay. I don't want them now. But here's why. I was thinking about this. And I, I read a story about this, about leaves. In the summertime, I mean, yeah, in the spring and summer, the leaves, they all turn this brilliant green. And I love, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but I love driving from this, from this church down Euclid Street because man you just see the trees and I love it when they're green and full of life they're green and they're full of life because in the summertime leaves have chlorophyll in them and what chlorophyll does is chlorophyll takes the light rays that come down and it sucks all that life up and it fills those that chlorophyll fills up and it makes the leaves green because green is, is, a, is, a, is a color that can't be, um, it, it just has to reflect. And so chlorophyll, it soaks up all the light, and it's green, and so the leaves are bright and green. But then when the weather starts to change and it starts to get colder, the roots of trees start going, uh-oh, this is not good. And so the root system of trees starts sucking all of that chlorophyll out of the branches and out of the leaves, and it sucks all that chlorophyll down into the roots so that the roots can prepare to withstand a winter time. And what happens when a leaf it's full of chlorophyll, starts having all the chlorophyll sucked out of it. Guess what? Now you can see the red and the yellows and the bright colors of fall that we love so much. Those reds and yellows are always there, even in the middle of summer. It's just that the green can't do anything but be reflected, so the green overrides the red and the yellows that are there. You just can't see it. Why am I telling you all this? Because I'm telling you that your flesh is your chlorophyll. There's praise in every single one of you that will shut the world down. There's enough power in this room to bring in a children's home. There's enough power in this room to, to facilitate a retirement home. There's enough power in this room to buy a set of apartments so that when a family's struggling, we don't just pat them on the head and wish them luck, but we put them in a place and we show them how to live. There's power in this room to touch every lost person in this community. There's power in this room. And if we would start evaluating the condition of our heart and we would start evaluating what we're thankful for and we would stop bowing at the altar can I preach to myself for a minute as long as we fill ourselves up at the altar of the Dallas Cowboys or of NASCAR or of an RV or of a boat or of a whatever else we fill ourselves up on because the chlorophyll of our flesh is sucking life out of but the RV gives me life the boat gives me life NASCAR gives me life Dallas Cowboys give me life and the chlorophyll of my flesh is sucking life out of all these things and what happens is when I'm full of this fake stuff you can't see the real reds and yellows in me that are desperate to praise my king and I started allowing myself to be drained of the things of life 
and my true colors are going to show up. And the only thing that's going to allow you to do that is to evaluate what your Thanksgiving looks like. Man, you just got preached to. I'm just going to tell you. See, ah, uh, that, sounds, that sounds bad. That sounds like I was fishing for your applause, and I wasn't. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you this. That is an aha for your face. But if you can't wait to get your butt out of the room and you don't want to hear and you're just engaged in the, that's okay. You're just full of your flesh. It's okay. It's just that you're going to miss an opportunity for your flesh to sit down and the spirit man inside you to rise up. And if you keep letting that happen, then the flesh man's going to continue to drive and the spirit man's going to keep sitting down and shutting up in the corner. One of these days, you're going to have to wake that joker up and let him drive. One of these days, you're going to have, you're going to, have to stop feeding your flesh in a constant state of just perverse obesity like I just want to eat everything the world will give me I just want to I want to gorge myself on it one of these days you'll stop and you'll start recognizing that the king of kings left heaven to come be your lord and he doesn't just want to be the savior of your death he wants to be the savior of your day today and when you catch that everything in life is going to start following that it's going to change things. Worship team, ooh, you better play fast because I preach long. I mean, that's what happens when you don't let me preach for two weeks. I got all this stuff I got to say, and I ain't about to say it quick. I want you to hear me. I just want you guys, if you would, stand up with me. We're, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, give you a chance to We have the, the uh, ministry team come forward. We want to be here to pray for you. We want to go after Jesus with you. We want that so desperately bad. But I'm asking you right now as we close this out, listen, please, ask yourself. You not to share it with me or anybody else, but ask yourself as we go into this last song what your thanksgiving looks like. Because if you won't figure out what you're thankful for, it's because you're still thankful for the wrong things. But once you figure this out, Hey, listen, can I just tell you one last thing? Jesus, Jesus does not mind interrupting your life. I don't know if you know that or not, but he's never going to apologize for it. The simple truth is we don't want him to interrupt our life. In fact, when we stay late in church, we're kind of ticked off a little bit that he interrupted our day. We don't even like that much. We dang sure don't want him interrupting our life. And I'm telling you this, church, he wants to interrupt your life. He wants to be the king of your today. He don't want to just interrupt your death. He cares. So, Father, fill us. Show us today and throughout this series, what is it? What is it that our, our hearts are thankful for? What does our Thanksgiving look like? Next week, Jesus, you, you're, you're just burning this word in me i'm so looking forward to preaching it next week i'm going to preach on are we in love with the king or are we in love with the idea of the king are we in love with you jesus or are we in love with the idea of you when it's convenient you see because when we fall in love with you as the person then convenience is no longer an issue for us so father show us what our thanksgiving looks like teach us we love you and honor you. We bless you in this place. Bless us today. Let this be an amazing, amazing day. Help us to chase you with all we got. That does not mean we have to give up everything in life. We still want the Cowboys to win today. But we want you to be glorified in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we hope that this week's message blessed you. If you want to stay up to date with things going on with the river, follow us on Facebook. But if this ministry has blessed you and you would like to sow into it, there's a couple ways to do that. One is you can download our River app, which is available on the iTunes Store and the Google Play Store. Or you could go to our website, www.theriverpanhandle.com, and give that way.